Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, News 24's Editor's Table. Uh, my name is Lloyd Bernard. I'm the editor at Sport24. Uh, welcome to, to all of our subscribers uh, joining us on, on News 24 uh, this evening. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you. As we progress over the next hour, please um, um, make sure you fire away your questions and comments uh, in our chat box. We're going to be unpacking all things South African cricket presently. It's obviously been a, a difficult few days, a difficult few weeks, a difficult year and a bit for, for South African cricket that's forced itself to, to, to ask itself some very difficult questions. Um, I just want to take some time to welcome our panel um, that we have with us today, our, our fine Sport24 journalists. Welcome to Sibusisu Mjiga Lisu, our deputy editor. Evening, Spoo. Thanks for having me. Evening, guys. Evening to everybody who's tuned in. Mr. Kaniso Chwaku, who has been sitting in the, the social justice and, and nation building hearings since day one. Um, I don't think anyone in the country has tuned in for as many hours as you, Chwaku. Good evening to you from our Johannesburg office. Good evening, good evening, Lloyd, and good evening to everyone that's tuned in. And Mr. Robert Howing, thank you from a, a wet and, and windy and, and rather miserable uh, Cape Town. And we know you're battling a, a pretty serious cold. So thank you for, for tuning in, Rob, and joining us. Evening to you. Good evening. Good evening to everybody. So, 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 chaps, let's dive in. And just again, if you if you missed it, our subscribers, please, uh, the chat box is there. Fire in some questions. Uh, we'll take as many as we can. There's a lot to unpack um, over the next hour or so, and we'll get through as much as we possibly can. But context here, um, obviously important. And I want to take us back, um, gentlemen, to July last year, when a 24-year-old, um, Lungi Ngiri, has asked a question at a press conference to, to respond to, to give his views on a, on a Black Lives Matter movement that is, that is sweeping the globe and, and finding its way into international sport as well. You know, we had seen um, what, what was happening in the, in the NFL and in European football. Um, and, and, and this was the first time the door kind of opened to having a South African conversation around it. Lungi, uh, in the most responsible, sober-minded way, possible acknowledges that it's a, a very serious issue, um, one that needs to be addressed at a, at a Proteus level um, and something that the team needs to sit down and talk about and address. Um, this is met with a hostile response from a, a small but vocal group of, of former white cricket players, um, uh, including, uh, you know, Butza Dipano and Pat Simcox on, on social media, who, 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 you know, if, if they didn't attack uh, Lungi himself, certainly attacked his position. Um, and, and rightly, South Africa unites uh, with this voice to, to defend uh, a young man who's, who's showed great maturity and taking on um, a very serious question. Um, in a matter of days, uh, this effectively opens the door to the conversation around systemic racism in South African cricket and its history and leads us to where we are now. Um, 40 South African cricket players, um, you know, past, mostly past, I think one or two present, um, just days after Lungi's press conference, uh, Unite in, in signing a letter, sending it to Cricket South Africa. Um, you know, we stand with Lungi and also it's time that we address these problems that have faced our game for as long as they have. Ashville Prince, Paul Adams, Makai Antini, Bernard Fernando, JP Dumini, Charles Langefant, Herschel Gibbs, Robin Peterson, among a few names who, who, who signed that letter and, and a striking quote from that letter, given South Africa's well-known past, black cricketers have borne the brunt of subtle and overt racist behavior for many years including from some colleagues. Um, Chris Nzani is president at the time at CSA. He commits to uh, investigating this uh, further. The admin problems that Cricket South Africa have then happen. Um, and we ultimately found ourselves committing to the SJN process, which is now underway. Trux, I want to go to you. Um, you've been covering this thing since day one. What has that process been like? We've heard a lot of testimonies. Where are we in that process right now? Um, and what have the last two months been like for you as a journalist covering this thing from day one? Um, thank you very much, Lloyd. It's been a difficult process um, in that a lot of former players have pretty much unraveled um, the, the discrimination that they've experienced. And in the manner in which they, they, it's not the kind of discrimination you would have expected them to experience um, post-1994 with, uh, with the covert and subtle racism that they talked about. Um, I mean, one would only listen to, one would listen to Paul Adams' um, testimony, uh, oral submission, um, one that has pretty much shaken up South African cricket to the core. There's also Kaya Zondos, which is the most recent one, I think. I think you, you know when you listen to, to Paul Adams' one, you, you can kind of sketch back how the times were 
uh, because at the time Paul Adams was 18 when he made his chest debut. You are still in his early 20s. Um, when he experienced all of these things. I mean, by the time Paul Adams was 30, um, he was already out of international cricket. But when you listen to Kaya Zondo's one, and one needs to remember that Kaya Zondo's particular oral, uh, oral submission wasn't actually made public until former CSA selector Hussein Manak actually testified and revealed what had happened with regards to Kaya Zondo not playing I mean, on the India tour back in 2015. And then when that particular um, oral, uh, that particular oral testimony was made public, I think it sunk home what, what, what SJN is really about. Yes, there were um, other testimonies from your Etim Balatis, your Lonobo Totobes, your Tami Tolegines um, that took aim at the match-fixing process. But also, if you peel off other layers, it also talked about the kind of discrimination they experience. One could turn and say, but um, those particular players were involved in match-fixing. Yes, that indeed happened. But can one also address how they landed up in that particular situation, how they got discriminated against? I mean, if you listen to how Etim Balati talked about the, uh, the, the, the salary discrepancies um, that he had in his career, um, when, uh, when, when Tami Tolegile talks about how his opportunities um, to play for the national team were blocked. I mean, one could turn and say that um, we still need a right of response. Yes, that is definitely going to come. But I mean, you, you, one would have expected that um, at the turn of the minute, at the turn of the minute, at the turn of the century, at some point when black players are performing, they'll be given an opportunity to actually, a, a, at least an opportunity, if, if they've done well enough at domestic level, done well enough at South Africa A level, at least they get an opportunity to play. I mean, um, Aaron Pagis was testimony about him going to two IC tournaments and not getting a game. Um, I mean, and if you look back at it, he was the only black player he, of, of those squads, he was the only player not to play. I mean, Roger Tiller Marcus went through the same experience. I mean, actual Prince, I'm um, talking about the things he experienced, I'm um, alleging at the hands of people you could call protest teammates in a, in a domestic game. So it, it, it was a very painful experience. Where are the SJN hearings now? Um, on Monday, a, a number of representatives came in, uh, a number of play, a number of legal representatives representing um, former administrators, former players, um, who were uh, alleged to have, I won't use the word indulged, but were in, alleged to have discriminated against um, people, um, put up representations of why um, they need extensions for their... Uh, for, for for the submissions and uh, mm. duly uh, those extensions were granted. So um, I think as things stand, looks like sometime early next month, which is September, um, the hearings will, will resume. Thank, thanks, Trux. Um, uh, and you mentioned, um, you, you know, Paul Adams's testimony, which which has been the one uh, certainly recently in the second half of the SJN that's that's kind of commanded the most headline space, I suppose, because of how. You know, shocking uh, uh, what he said was. Uh, Spoo, I'm going to go to you here, but um, you, you know, Paul Adams um, testifies and and shares, um, you know, an experience he had, or experiences he had in his in his in his time as a Proteus player, where uh, he's surrounded by teammates who at fine meetings um, are, are singing uh, a nickname has been assigned to him um, um, that is obviously offensive, um, and he speaks about that at great length. In his testimony, Mark, Truck said, "You know, we're at the point now where responses are coming in, um, and anyone implicated in these hearings and any of the testimonies will be afforded an opportunity to tell his or her side of the story in response, and that's what's happening now." Um, Mark Boucher uh, is is one of the players identified who 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 who, who used this, this this name for Paul Adams um, during his playing days. Um, certainly not the only one. It's a it's a fines meeting. It's it's a whole group of players that are doing this. But you know, Mark Boucher is the national head coach, and I suppose that now at this current moment in time, does place him under under more of a microscope than than his peers of that generation. Mark Boucher releases a fourteen page affidavit on Monday, explaining in detail the culture that existed back then, explaining his uh, naivety and the naivety of the group of players back then, uh, apologizing for the offence caused. Um, in the Adams situation in particular, we worked on that affidavit for, 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 for News 24 on Tuesday and we, we, we went through it at length. I just want to hear from you, um, 14 pages of, 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 of Mark Boucher's response. What were your big takeaways um, that came out of that affidavit for you? Yeah, thanks, Lloyd. Um, I mean, Kanyuso makes a lot of good points as well um, about, you know, about, about where this all uh, stems from. And I think for me, what came from Boucher's response, um, I don't want to invalidate his response, but it, the apology itself, the 14-page affidavit, was revealing on its own. I mean, 
there's a lot of things that are unprompted that are revealed in that affidavit. I mean, he's trying to, I guess, add context to everything that happened, but at the same time, he, he's, he's peeled the curtain further back, uh, showing us exactly what took place in these dressing rooms. I mean, he, in one of the biggest takeaways was the fact that he said in that environment, lots of us had nicknames for each player, which had a racial connotation. And we all called each other those names. It could have been black, African guys, African guys, uh, the Asian guys, the white guys. This is all written by Mark Barcher. And he said that he was given a nickname uh, which made reference to his skin color by one or two players, uh, but that he can categorically state that he did not give Mr. Adams, Paul Adams, that is, that nickname. Um, it's damning. Uh, it's, it's, it's an indictment on, on, on cricket, on the Proteus, that casual racism was flying about, not just uh, in, the, in the allegation that faces Boucher directly, but the fact that this was commonplace uh, in the team, you know, uh, not a coach, not a team manager, not a captain uh, spoke up and said, look, guys, we must take cognizance of the fact that, you know, we are trying to rebuild a new country. We are trying to, you know, to, 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 to hold each other's hands in this forced marriage of a new democracy, which wasn't easy on anybody. On, on the previous uh, end of the divide, you know, or, or what, whichever lines of the divide you, you, you fell on. And, and he expresses that voucher, um, which is a valid point on its own, um, that it wasn't an easy transition and, and perhaps they, they didn't get the help that they needed to transition from a segregated uh, team. But I, I have to question, I have to question uh, the fact that a 20 year old Mark Boucher comes into this team and just falls in line with all the bad habits um, of this team. I mean, you'd expect um, Boucher coming in at 20, 1997, um, you, you know, he, he's not one of those that came, you know, pre, he wasn't a, an apartheid era Proteus player that, that then had to be reintegrated. He came in supposedly with new eyes, you know, because he had never been there before. Then for him to take on, this this kind of attitude for which he's been accused, for me, uh, it it takes one aback. And not only that, and in one of the, you know, private conversations I've had with a former Proteus player who came in later in the team, um, maybe towards when Paul Adams as well was was winding down his Proteus career, he said this this name was prevalent um, in the early two thousands, not just at the period of naivety when Boucher came in. He says, I was, he said, I was a 21 year old and I came into the Proteus team and I heard this name being referred to uh, Paul Adams. And this was years later, uh, years after the fact, you know, and so now you're not talking about young men anymore. You're talking about uh, people who've just gotten in, get gotten, uh, gotten to grips with this culture and they've, they've, they made it the Proteus culture, you know, um, and and you know Mark Barcher's played 15 years uh, for for the for the Proteus, and one shudders to think, you know, if Paul Adams hadn't mentioned this, if he hadn't come forward at, at SJM, because I feel he is one of the strongest voices to come post Lungingidi. Uh, uh, this is almost like another layer to Makai and Dini saying, um, I did I did not run from training to the hotel room out of want to get fitter. I ran because I suffered loneliness in the team bus as the only black African. Paul Adams' statement was just another layer being peeled back. And I suspect he might've prompted one or two others uh, who might've missed this boat or might've been reluctant uh, to say that, look, you know what? I'll never get another chance to get this out of my chest. So the time is now. And we saw Kaya Zon as well, whom uh, uh, Chwaku mentioned. Kaya's never spoken about his 2015 uh, India experience. Um, we're told that he asked that his testimony be released publicly so that at least he can have his story told. Mm. Thanks. For, I'm just going to go to the chat box uh, here, and, and it's, it's so funny that it's Fedos uh, Mundo commenting in our chat box, given that I was actually going to, for my next question, throw one of your tweets, Fedos, uh, to, to Rob. But I'm just going to read uh, 
the doses uh, comment completely agree with Sabu's view that the extent of the casual racism reflects on the whole team. We need to be cognizant of that when assessing this. Also, it might be worth considering that players from the mid 90s to mid 2000s grew up with parents, caregivers, etc., who would have had an influence on the thought patterns of their children. So the real question is, how do we know that the next generation of cricketers have not been influenced in the same way, or do we just hope? Um, Rob, you you were uh, we speaking about this culture? That's a, you know the common theme here. You know, South African cricket staring at staring into the mirror now, having a thorough self examination of this culture. You know what it was like. Um, you know post-democracy um, through those years of the 90s all the way up until, until, until now. You know, there's an Enoch and queer resignation that happens um, that suggests that culturally there are still problems today. But Rob, you were on the 1992 tour to the West Indies. Um, you know, you were covering cricket closely, South Africa's first test tour, um, you know, post-isolation. And for those that tweet that, that, that you posted earlier today, suggesting that South African cricket and South African sports, you know, came out of isolation too quickly. Um, you know, we hadn't even had uh, our first democratic election yet. Rob, what was the environment in that Protea setup like at the time? Was there a divide that was just so blatantly obvious? If you can just help us understand, um, you know, from a team culture perspective and from an atmosphere perspective, what South African cricket was like at that time. Well, Lloyd, it was actually very difficult at the time to even talk of a divide, really, because uh, very simply, uh, that, that uh, test team that played in that lone but very famous test in, in Bridgetown, Barbados against West Indies uh, was, was all white. Um, they were uh, predominantly players who had um, cut their teeth in the uh, apartheid era, um, some of whom were right in the twilights of their career and uh, were grateful uh, in, in many instances and in some cases should have been more grateful, frankly, for the fact that they were given a very premature opportunity um, to, to cut their teeth in international cricket. For some of the sort of 35, 36, 37 year olds, um, a wonderful chance to, to finally you know, break out of that sort of 15, 20 years or whatever it was of isolation that might have affected them. Um, and it was through the generosity of um, you know, uh, a freed liberation, great liberation leaders of the time, uh, like Nelson Mandela, uh, Steve Chwete, et cetera, that South Africa were even given the license to, to go and play um, abroad. We were still in apartheid. Our democratic elections only came in 94. Um, so can you, you can imagine the, um, the sort of the, the poignancy and the symbolism of going to the Caribbean of all places where obviously apartheid um, resistance was um, particularly fervent um, and a very hostile environment initially. Um, I'll never forget, you know, leaving the airport uh, surrounded by, um, wailing sirens, police escort, um, and lots of people giving the middle finger from the side of the road to the South African bus, uh, which was uh, a little daunting and, and just a little wake up call um, that this, these were very, very early days. But in answer to your question, um, you know, uh, you couldn't gauge a team culture then because it was an all white uh, uh, outfit. Everybody was very comfortable around each other. They had been comfortable in their sort of curry cup bubbles um, for, for years and years. Um, and uh, it, it sort of made you realize how a little further up the line, you know, when, for instance, uh, as Chuck said, uh, when Paul Adams came on the scene about two years later, um, just how difficult it must have been um, for some of those first players of color to come into the national setup um, on their own, effectively. And I, I guess that their, their first instinct was to, to almost feel obliged to buy into the existing team culture, warts and all. Um, and kind of accept that that was the way things were done. And only later, clearly, as more and more black players, um, uh, you know, uh, became involved, they were able to actually, um, you know, create a sense of identity um, and actually fight their, start fighting their corners. Um, so it's in later years that, that clearly, um, you know, you had more of a, a tangible rubbing of shoulders uh, in the dressing room culturally, but um, it's, it was, you know, they were, they were, clearly difficult, tentative days. And we now know that, um, you know, uh, they were filled with, uh, you know, some pretty damning uh, incidents that, uh, that made the black players um, start to really sort of get their backs up. And, and it took a long time, but gradually, of course, uh, we had this uh, explosion of, uh, of, of anger and a wish to, to unpack um, you know, what had gone down before. Um, it's not as though all of those white cricketers uh, who were lucky enough to get those opportunities early doors um, were necessarily sort of, uh, you know, aware of the, um, 
the, the sort of privilege that they've got in being able to to get those opportunities in those in those early days. I don't want to uh, leave without uh, uh, attempting to at least uh, provide some kind of uh, uh, answer to Fedos's question, um, which is, you know, obviously around the influence that individuals have coming into those teams, you know, the, the kind of culturally and, you know, their experiences of South Africa, especially for players who are playing in the 90s to, to 2000, you know, what, what they would have come with with their own backgrounds uh, into that, that environment. How do we stop that going forward? I suppose you'll always have um, you know, players of different backgrounds and beliefs and politics and, and religions coming into team environments. But I suppose that's where the responsibility lies on, on a Cricket South Africa to, 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 to engage, um, you know, with its players, with its staff um, culturally to get to a point where there are active things happening um, at a CSA playing level um, inside the dressing room and outside where, where there's, it's not just the case of, you know, different people here with different beliefs and backgrounds, there's actually something here, there's a philosophy, there's something we stand for, this is what we're going to be working on. I suppose it's happened to an extent with these hearings, um, and then also in the form of the, the culture camps, you know, which are, are things that are happening now where, we, where, where, the, where the team is trying to identify an ethos and, and something that it wants to stand for. But I want to move on. Uh, thanks for that, Rob, and, and for Dose. Um, and Spoo, I'm going to go back to you, um, if that's okay. And I want to talk about what happened uh, yesterday. You know, Mark Boucher obviously under a lot of pressure, given the fact that he's been the first to respond, given that he's, um, you know, so heavily implicated in the Adams testimony. And yesterday, um, uh, or Monday rather, um, uh, the, 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 the Enoch and Queer story happens, and Enoch and Queer resigns as assistant coach of the Proteus team. Um, and 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 in, the, in, in what I guess we can describe as a joint statement between Enoch and, and Cricket South Africa highlights uh, cultural issues within the team at the moment, uh, a working environment that is problematic. Um, for a coach already under pressure, um, before that news drops, um, you know, what did you make of the Enoch and Queer resignation and, and, and the statement that came with it? Yeah, I know that was not good um, for, for the pro tiers, not good for, for, for Mark Boucher's tenure, that one of his uh, trusted uh, lieutenants uh, stepped down, especially not good it being someone like Enoch Nguye, who is highly regarded in cricket coaching circles and uh, regarded as one of the progressive thinkers of the game uh, and somebody whom Cricket South Africa made a desperate attempt um, to, to keep his services. Uh, and the fact that the, the, he did mention his concerns over not only the functioning, but the culture of the team, damning as well, in a week where... Boucher sent out his response to 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 the the, the accusations um, leveled against him at SJN. It, it was almost like a, a, a double whammy uh, that has left the the, the Proteus uh, and its head coach uh, with a knee on the canvas on the canvas, so to speak. Um, for me, it's been building, um, especially the cultural stuff. Uh, or the cultural discord. And I'll take you back to when Lungingidi mentioned the fact that he would support Black Lives Matter and he would urge his teammates to do so. Uh, immediately, former players uh, split right down the middle where you have your Buta Dipenas on one side and then you have the 40 um, uh, uh, Black former cricketers uh, uh, and coaches on, on the other side and 30-odd 30 or, 30 of whom were, were former pro tiers. And it, it, I, it reflected itself in the current protest dressing room as well because there was discord over would they take a knee or would they not. Then there was the almost comical uh, display of, of raising of the fist that didn't really land um, the message that, you know, they thought it would because it then just became, a, you know, an island on its own, like a symbol that, you know, is no longer or isn't the current symbol recognized for anti-discrimination. It became very, very difficult for this team to unite under this current recognized symbol of taking the knee. And then they took it to the West Indies where, you know, you saw the black players kneeling and Rasifa and Edison, others choosing not to kneel at all and simply just to stand and, and one or two raising their fists. It, the discord was palpable. And you, if, if, if Enoch is going to talk about um, the culture, he, that is going to be one of the conversations that would have taken place 
he wouldn't have known exactly what this team stands for, despite all the PR stuff that we've been fed over and over, despite the cultural camps. It never transpired, or it never came across to me at least, that this team was united uh, with one message because the messaging in itself was convoluted. And I suspect that the, when the Paul Adams stuff came, it then just dialed everything up to, to, to 100 degrees because then it was a matter of the coach having to explain his actions that happened when he was a player. Then you've got a black a white ball captain now who also needs answers from his head coach as to coach, how can this have happened when you were there? Um, I know it was a different time. However, this is a lot about your character. Um, and and Temba Bavuma said they did get an explanation. He did not say specifically or categorically whether that explanation was satisfactory. Um, so if you read between the lines, um, you'll see that there was no categorical outright to say, no, nope, we're happy. We'll never raise it again. We're, we're happy to move forward. It's, we got the explanation and, 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 and the team will just, you know, move along with that. And um, you add that and, 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 and rumors that Enoch was being undermined and, and, and you, you the, this part was going to boil over. It's mm-hmm. just a pity because Enoch is um, in terms of coaching currency is one of the best that we have got. Um, and he's approaching the prime of his coaching careers, and that intellectual capital shouldn't be sitting at home where he is with his family. Mm. Um, it should be shared. We should share him with the national team or, 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 or one of the teams in the country. Thanks, Boo. Trucks, I'm going to throw you a question from Anonymous uh, that's appeared in the chat box. Um, just uh, quite an interesting one, actually. Uh, it appears that meaningful changes took place, and I presume these are cultural changes that this that this anonymous is talking about during the period that Faf Duplessis was the captain. Um, you know, what do you make of a Faf Duplessis? Because there's a guy who's been in charge of of a of a, of a, of a Proteus team for a, for a fair few years, and I suppose at different varying levels of success of that team, there was a feeling that you know this team certainly in terms of results. And and also in in well before <laughs> the before cricket World Cup 2019 at least uh, was taking the right steps in terms of results and and you know um, transformation seemed to be something that was happening in South African cricket organically at times as well with players coming through under the Faf Duplessis captaincy. Do you think that's a fair statement to say that culturally the Proteas looked in a good place under Faf Duplessis? Well. When you look back at what has happened now, I mean, nothing has transpired um, under Faf Duplessis' captaincy um, so far in the SJN. So it would be difficult to point fingers at him and say that um, Faf was involved I mean, all of this. Um, there was that uh, one blooper that he made when, when, when there wasn't clarity on why Timber was dropped um, ahead of the England series. That was 2019-2020. Uh, where um, if I remember correctly, says um, if I remember correctly, says I do see color. Um, it was something that did, that that did not quite sit well um across South Africans. So I think there, if there were changes, there there were um, there were minimal per se. But when you look back, when you track back at the particular testimonies, um, the oral testimonies that were made um through SJN, there weren't there wasn't any reference um that was made to 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 five to places. Um, captaincy era that would also include that that team was also coached by Russell Domingo. Um, Russell Domingo may at some point come under fire because the Aaron, the Aaron Pangiso issues um, came under his tenure. Um, I mean, Otis Gibson, I mean, as you rightly say, that um, the, the Faf Duplessis era, as, as well as it started, um, will forever be remembered for that absolutely horrendous um, 2019 World Cup blowout. But just to go back to what um, Robert had mentioned, um, with regards to the 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 the, the, the 1992-94 era, where a number of players came through the Curry Cup system, um, which is now the four-day franchise series, or well, back the four-day provincial series until CSA gives it a name again. Um, it's worth mentioning that there's been a lot of text, there's been a lot of writing, um, especially amongst uh, circus, uh, circus people, that um, in, in the move to unify, um, there was a fair bit of assimilation instead of unification, where a lot of the, the, the colored boards, um, the, the boards of color, um, when they joined the UCP, it was they joined an already set, uh, an, an already set cricket uh, uh, superstructure that they now needed to be part of instead of actually dismantling 
a that system and actually forming a new one. So I mean, it 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 it, it, it again, it's it, it, it's a it, it's a debate for another day because I think it it would, it, it would take it would move this current debate that we're having um in a different direction. Um, but look, it's again at some point maybe maybe five ten year could and should be examined. But I think when you look at the number of players of color that were playing um in that particular tenure. Um, so far, there hasn't been anything said about it. And you, you also understand that a number of those uh, black players um, who are playing in FAF's tenure are actually still active members in the, t- in the, in the various formats. Um, another comment from Tim Nkosi. Um, not a question, but a comment. What has happened in cricket South Africa is a mirror image of racial dynamics in South Africa. Cricket in South Africa has always mirrored political and racial developments. The two are inherently intertwined. Uh, after this phase of revelation, we need to respond in a manner that appreciates these complex nuances. Uh, we touched on on, on Temba um, um, Tabu when you when you spoke about the fact that he was on Monday. I think it was that the Proteas left for for Sri Lanka and Temba, as you said, you know, fronted up to media um, um, before that team's departure. Rob, um, what's going through a player's uh, mind now? I mean, a, a, a young captain in terms of captaincy experience in in Temba, trying to find his feet in the position. Um, you, you know, going to Sri Lanka two months out from a Cricket World Cup, um, you know, trying to develop this team into a, a World Cup challenging outfit uh, who's now juggling a whole lot of balls seemingly at the moment and only one of them is that Cricket World Cup. Um, you, know, you, you know, what do you make of that? I mean, it can't be an easy time for him either. Yeah, it's certainly not. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, uh, unashamedly an admirer of, of Timber. I think that's come through in my, in my writing quite a bit. I was, I was delighted when he was made the white ball captain. Um, I felt he was fully deserving of it. Uh, I think his his white ball record has been highly promising, um, and uh, he's faced you know all the inevitable sort of pressures and and bigotries uh, associated with our sort of um, you know the whole um, uh, cricketing saga in South Africa. Um, he's he's had to he's had to wrestle um, a lot of uh, you know detractors and so on. But he's a, he's very strong minded. He's incredibly strong minded. Um, and if there's one thing that I, th- I think won't change um, is that he will he will go out of his way, certainly on the Sri Lankan tour, to um, to ensure that he still has what he considers his his uh, all important part of the dressing room as as captain. Uh, so regardless of what's going on elsewhere, as as Sabu said, uh, we're not we can't be completely sure. Um, how he feels deep down. It's it. It was also rushed. You know, they they got on a plane um, pretty soon after the uh, after the bomb burst kind of thing. So um, off they went to Sri Lanka. Um, uh, Timber was quoted as saying that um, uh, Mark Boucher had played open cards with the squad, uh, provided clarity and context. Um, but that, of course, can't be seen as as an endorsement uh, or necessarily a. Um, you know, uh, detractive sort of uh, statement. We, we just don't know. What I do know is that um, it's 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 not a great distraction for Timber to have. This is his last uh, opportunity for a team that's actually on a little bit of a roll. You could say, having won two 2020 series in a row after being in a serious doldrums, um, you just get a sense that things were beginning to pick up a little bit. And it'll be up to him more than anybody, perhaps, um, to try to still sort of stamp his authority. I, I've been impressed by. Uh, what I've seen of his body language on the field. Um, he's quite a taskmaster. He, he wants his players to perform. He's quite animated um, when standards drop. Um, so I'm, I'm not too concerned about his, um, how he's going to handle it because I think, I think he's capable of carrying quite a, quite a weight on his shoulders. He, he was already carrying a significant weight on his shoulders. Um, a lot of it unfair, but a weight nevertheless. And um, I think, I think he'll, he'll be okay. What will be very interesting is... Um, uh, to gauge after this tour, as it's the last, we think the last T20 opportunity before the World Cup, um, to see whether um, the head coach, Mark Boucher, uh, effectively still has the dressing room, as they say. Um, but uh, from a captaincy point of view, I think Tembo will stick to um, what he believes in and, and not much will, will change on that front. But I feel for him because it's, it's a very difficult little time. Um, you know, uh, people will be looking for signs of body language, um, what the players are saying, who's talking to who in Sri Lanka. Um, it's going to be a quite a fascinating little period, um, and with with a World Cup only only weeks away, which is which is quite a quite an intimidating thought. Mm-hmm. I want to just go back to to the hearings because you know we're speaking a lot about um, um, and understandably so about the about the Mark Boucher 
uh, response um, and his and his place in this in this testimony and in these hearings. Um, but he's not the only only person whose whose name has has come up and and you know we say implicated and 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 uh, AB uh, de Villiers obviously uh, a central figure in the Kyle Zondo selection that we've spoken about and then Graham Smith um, you know in his current role of director of cricket. So Boo, on on the Graham uh, uh, Smith um, issue, we keep hearing um, you know in, 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 on social media and, and and the public and people in the testimonies that have that have raised concerns over the appointment. And if you go back to December 2019 and the, the state that cricket was in at the time, um, you know, I think it's, uh, we know for a fact that Graham, Graham Smith was somebody who was on the radar of the, the powers that be at Cricket South Africa to bring him in and to kind of steady the ship, you know, that was a bit all over the place at that period, um, following that, that, that World Cup that, that we spoke about earlier, and then just all of the sponsorship and administrative problems that were, have, that were happening at the time. So... You know, there have been concerns raised by people in the testimony around how Graham Smith was appointed and then by association how Mark Boucher was appointed. Is this hearing um, the, the forum to, to, to delve into HR kind of procedures that were followed at Cricket South Africa and how people were appointed? Um, and if so, why? But just your take on, 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 on why the, the, the actual issues of the, the appointments keep coming up. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair, fair question, you know. Um, look, it's a tough one to call to say yes, it is or no, it isn't, because, I mean, there is no other public forum that's going to open up specifically for the contracts, you know, um, but there is dissatisfaction with regards to the Mark, the, the, the Graham Smith appointment, which then led to the Mark Batch appointment. Um, they've sort of been lumped together, but just to deal specifically with the director of cricket, um, the Smith initially rejected um, the uh, Cricket South Africa's advances for this role. And he had his reasons, of course, and, and, and his reservations, and they were fair. You know, this is somebody that they courted. This is somebody Cr Cricket South Africa courted for months, the, the previous CEO, uh, Tabang Mura, is known to have, um, you know, coveted Graham Smith so much so that um, it's 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 alleged that you know he gave him sort of carte blanche to hire and fire as 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 he may please, which is how then in 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 a matter of days from Smith getting appointed, um, Mark Boucher was given a four year contract, which no other Proteus, uh, you know, post I I think post nineteen ninety four was 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 given. Um, and then, you know, then there was a lot of grumblings. Then the, there was questions which uh, Dr. Kula Ameyo uh, raised, you know, I mean, you can think what you can of her um, as a person, but she did raise uh, concerning things such as the amounts that were remunerated to Graham Smith changed as well. And with, there were procedural, you know, discrepancies in terms of his contract, some clauses that he wanted certain CEOs to be to be to be made as the um, uh, the CSA CEO, you know, all those sort of under the table things that you wouldn't want an organization that is running functionally to to permit. Um, whether it's, is SJN really the forum? I think if you really get to the nub of it, it's not really the forum. Um, but if you're going to raise matters of privilege and white privilege specifically, uh, then yes. Then, then if you're going to say, would any other person get, uh, you know, as much rope as, as Graham Smith has for this role? Um, no, but is it because he's white or is it because he's a former protest captain? You know, so you start blurring those lines. And then you, you've got guys that, you know, were involved in match fixing that have also used the SJM process and the Black Lives Matter conversation to get their point across that they were unfairly treated on the basis of the color of their skin and they were targeted for, for match fixing. Um, and, and, you know, they were saying there were white players who did the same things who were implicated as well that didn't face charges, allegations that were denied by Judge Mwepe who oversaw that process. So, Really, SJN has become a bit of a free for all for whoever has discrepancies. I mean, we saw Tabang Muri arrive at the at SJN and and seldom mention anything race related um, by his own discrepancies, and he's not 
you know, uh, you know, breathed a single uh, word over his, his accusations that you know eventually led to his axing at 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 uh, cricket South Africa. So it, it's become a bit of a free fall. Um, but the scope was wide, and to miss Zabeza's door was as wide open as possible. Obviously, we have to give him the 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 trust that he can distill really the terms of reference of this process uh, to what everybody else is, is 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 sort of chucking in onto his plate, and and that's his job at the end of the day to do. Um, but yeah, to answer the question, I really don't think it's it was necessarily the place, but. I don't think also it's my place to say, no, they shouldn't have done so because others have thrown in other sort of subjects in this open forum for, for, for advocates of Eza to deal with. Mm. I tried to, I mean, you know, we've spoken at length about this, um, uh, uh, all of us in, in, in covering this story and, you know, in its, in its best shape, the SJN is a, a necessary process that Cricket South Africa had to have, right? I mean, uh, if, if, if done in, in the right spirit, this is an opportunity for Cricket South Africa to have those conversations with itself that it hasn't had before, to, to interrogate its own history, uh, to acknowledge that there were flaws in systems and, and culturally, and to ensure ultimately that the mistakes of the past are not repeated moving forward. I mean, that, for me, looking at this thing, and I mean, I know there was, there was, there was, there was uh, um, at one stage, uh, conversations around financial compensation as well, for players who had, you know, suffered injustices in years past. I'm not sure where we are on that front now, if that's still possible. But, you know, in its purest form, the SJN's purpose is to acknowledge the mistakes of times past, um, for apologies to happen, for accountability to happen, and then to ensure that these mistakes are not repeated. Um, is that it for you? I mean, once this is all said and done, regardless, of, we knew it was going to get, you, you, it wasn't going to be an easy process. Tough questions were going to be asked. It wasn't going to be a breeze. It, these weeks like to this week were going to happen. It was inevitable. But regardless of the casualties that come between now and the end of this process, whenever it may be, what's for you the end goal here? When we're done, where the coaches have, have, have survived or they've resigned, um, if there are casualties along the way, when we're all done with this hearing and this process, um, and it's been wrapped up and the recommendations come in. Where is South African cricket then for you? Um, Lloyd, one of the unwritten, one of the unspoken words in South Africa uh, through the through since 94 is that um, black people have accepted an apology that has never come their way with regards to um, the acceptance of apartheid. And it's seemingly become the case um, with cricket. I mean, as things stand, the, the recommendations are going to become very crucial. Um, I mean, the responses are going to become very crucial. I mean, there's a sect of society that is absolutely upset that um, these accusations have been made and that they've been made in a manner that, um, that, that they've sullied people's reputations. Um, but there's a sect of society that feels that on one hand, there were people when they were in charge of specific positions they felt that they acted wantonly. Now that it's time to account for those particular actions, it's like, no, I can't be accounted for this because I was doing this in a particular time frame. Um, one would look back that when it comes to the issue of discrimination, there's, there shouldn't be any time frames. I mean, I'll, I'll use the Holocaust in, as an example. I mean, if there are any Nazi prison guards, security guards, even in their ripe old age, or quote, they're still in prison in Europe for actively participating um, in the Holocaust. So when it comes to discrimination, there isn't a time frame. If you discriminated against a player 15, 20 years ago, and that player comes up and there's proof that you actually did so, you still need to face time for that for, for that crime because you infringe on a person's uh this thing, dignity. Um, it's gonna be a very tricky tightrope for CSA to walk. Um, because I mean, if if the recommendations uh come back and they say that um particular individuals who did A, B, C, and D um to 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 these individuals um need to relinquish their positions because it is untenable for them to be in a in a particular position of power that deals with various groupings of people it's going to be it may lead to to difficult legal processes because i mean look at the end of the day um the sjn just like uh, the trc is a restorative justice process um but again justice also comes with compensation and I mean, the, the, the compensation issue was one that I, I, I suspect is still in the air. But if you sit in a, in a case of Aaron Pangis, where you went to a World Cup, um, he explained the amounts lucidly. You go to a World Cup and don't get, uh, don't get a game. 
That meant of that 50,000 rand match fee, you're only getting a third of it. And getting a third of it, that means you're collecting a third of that money through, tourna- through a whole tournament. That is eight games. And then you go to an India tour, five games, you only play one. That means you're going to get 150,000. You start to realize that you, you haven't only suffered a loss of income. You've suffered a loss of opportunity. And that is one, one of the trending things that Akaya Zondo talked about, or Roger Telemarco talked about, and Aaron Pagiso, because he said that had he played in India, even if it was two to three games, in conditions that allowed for him, who would, who would have known what kind of doors um, that would have opened for him? I mean, if you remember how well he performed in the 2012 um, Champions League, 28, this was such a tenor at the time was playing for Mumbai Indians. Everyone was talking about who Aaron Pangizo is, and it actually fast-tracked um, his international debut. I mean, I remember when the Dolphins um, went to the Champions League to 20, when, and that's when Andile Pechukwayo's name um, became a household name because he actually played uh, in fits and starts, but he showed a fair bit of talent at the time, and then everyone started to talk about who is Andile Pechukwayo. So a lot of the guys are talking about opportunities. If you look at an actual prince, um, his test tent um, actually opened a significant door for him. Um, to play county cricket long after his international cricket, international career ended. I mean, he got an opportunity to play at Lords in 2008. He scored the first innings 100 that allowed South Africa to actually not save the follow-on, but wait a long way to save in the game. Scouts from Lancashire may have been watching the game and they realized that when this guy's able, when this guy's got an opportunity to play for us, we must bring him in. He showed an aptitude and an ability to play in English conditions. So it's going to be a very tricky title because what has emanated or while, while, while Spoon is right is that Sometimes the lines have been blurred with regards to what the SJN is there for. The one thing advocates of it that did mention is that they are not dealing with particular matches of the um, of the match fixing case, but whether there was discrimination, and that is what now and and, and, and in the South African context, discrimination has either been very easy to prove and very hard to prove on the same wavelength. So you look at the current issues that the CSA board has to deal with. That report is when, especially when, it, when, when everyone has responded, is going to make for very interesting reading. Mm. Yeah, can I just jump in on that point um, of, of selection, uh, which, is, which is very, very, very big. Um, we've heard Aaron Pangiso's story, um, but we heard Roger Telemachus' story as well, of how he got into a physical altercation with the coach because he was promised game time. Um, and yeah, you know, selection is such a hard thing to, to get down to the bottom of because you want the best team to win. You want momentum. You want a winning feeling. You want guys who don't have runs under their belt, but you know they can perform for you. You want them to be out there in the middle play. At the same time, there are guys that are hungry and they need a chance. You've got your Kaya Zondos and uh, who are hungry and can show at least get an opportunity to say, okay, this is your hit and miss opportunity. You know, uh, we'll throw you out there to see what you can do. And I think that that burns a lot of, um, you know, black cricketers is, is, is that in times of critical um, appointment, they've not gotten the benefit of the doubt. The proteas have gone with a guy, a safe, out of form guy who's probably not, you know, are up to par and ignored guys who deserve the chance. I mean, a, a guy like even Garnet Kruger um, was was in his test form, never got to play, but toured with South Africa to Australia, was in, in the South African team um, for a New Zealand test, but he never got to play a test match despite being the leading uh, four-day wicket taker in the country. Uh, Ethim Balati, yes, he got involved in match fixing, but he says he was told, he has to wait for Makai and Dini to retire for him to then become a protein. Like it's 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 just utter nonsense like that that kind of really irks a lot of these players. Is that yes, selection and merit definitely uh, is, is is the first bar one needs to clear. But then why must there be all these other things like you know the the the, the Makai? There's a, there can only be one Makai and Dini in the team. Um, or one black fast bowler in the team. And why can't you get the best players in that environment pushing, putting pressure on, on your premium players? You know, you've got your starting 11. Why can't you bring your best performing domestic players in and say, look, you might be the best, but there is no room to not perform because that will then push us and have success because you've got an epi breathing down Makaya's neck or breathing down whoever else's neck, Dale State. Say, guys, 
Eddie is performing down here. We bring him into the team. So none of you actually have 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 the room to relax. And and I think that may have played in some of the pro tiers poor performances, especially at major tournaments, because guys know, some guys know that their places are are basically untouchable. And once you've got that complacency, believe me, you're gonna see it out there in the middle. Mm. I mean, Lloyd, just to come in, Lloyd, um, interesting absence, absentees from SJN now that uh, listening to what Swear said. Would have been interesting to listen to what Kyle Abbott would have said about that 2015 World Cup semi final selection because, I mean, it's still a very hot topic um, with regards to what had happened with him getting dropped. I mean, a discrimination isn't bound by color. We need to be very clear about it. You could be white and still be discriminated against. He has not actually come forward on this platform and actually explained what had happened. And interesting absentees, again, from this particular process are uh, two, I would say, the longest serving CEOs in one, um, Gerald Machola. Um, I mean, he served a very long term and a lot of things happened under his tenure and he hasn't actually come to this particular platform. And as the presiding officer explained what had happened between the, he was, the time he was in charge from 2001 to 2011. I mean, the same would apply for Harun Lokat, who was serving um, on CSA's uh, interim board. Um, I mean, mm. he was uh, an accounting officer from 2013 to 2017. That, in a four-year stretch, and if you look at the Pangiso thing happened in his time, the um, count, everything happened in his time, surely, 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 those two accounting officers should have at least made some sort of representation because even if you're the CEO and you can you can pledge denial and say that um, I was not looking after <clears throat> I was not looking after this thing these particular selection matters one needs to remember that Hassan Manek said in that particular AB de Villiers matter in Mumbai there was a conversation that was had with Mr Logat with regards to the to the issue of selection so it's those two I mean I mean it, it's all good and well to hear from the players. Um, but when it comes to accounting officers, they I think their voices here would have been very, very, very crucial. They wouldn't yeah. say no, the world has pulled over our eyes. No, 100 percent Trucks, I'm gonna stop you there. We're running out of time. I just want to get through a couple of quick questions from, from a couple of the readers as well. Uh Jeffrey Katz, why was Boucher not suspended and replaced by his assistants? It would have been seamless at worst and would have been more. Uh, unifying at best. I suppose the quick answer to that, Jeffrey, is, you know, um, this process is not completed. Uh, the, the, the process of the SJN is not completed. In fact, Mark Bausch's 14-page affidavit is one uh, submission that he's making. He has committed to making further submissions um, as well that will come uh, treating each incident in more depth. Um, and, and while he's also open to one-on-one -on -one chats with, with, with people, I would imagine, like Paul Adams himself, uh, moving forward. Um, Andre Immelman comments, the conduct of the controlling body of South African cricket has brought not only SA cricket, but the country into disrepute. How has this contributed uh, to the ongoing underlying racial context in the team? I suppose that's difficult to, 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 uh, to know what's going on within that team. You know, we spoke about a Temba Bavuma uh, press conference on, on Monday before the team left for Sri Lanka and speaking about, you know, uh, the fact that open cards have been played. Um, but I think as Rob and Sabu have both said, you know, um, reading between the lines, it's difficult to assess exactly what the feelings are in that change room uh, right now. Um, but I'm sure um, developments uh, as, as they progress, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about that. Um, and then Fado says to other people, uh, Trucks just responding um, to, to you. Um, about your notable absentees that she would have liked to have seen in the SJN were uh, a Hashim Amla and uh, a Vernon uh, Philander as well, um, speaking in the testimony. I'm not sure, Trucks, and I'm going to give you the mic very briefly. Um, just tell us, um, when can we expect this to be uh, finally wrapped? Is there, is, there a, is there a cutoff date? Is there a date that Cricket South Africa has committed to to have everything completed by? Or, or is it a case of as long as it takes, we'll take the time? Um, if I remember correctly, just given a six-month time frame. Um, so I think toward, and I suspect that towards end of the month, that end of September, um, the report should have been delivered um, to CSA. But as things stand, it does not look like that's going to be possible because, one, there were extensions um, that were granted to particular legal representatives. Um, that will mean that um, hearings will only start in September. I mean, hearings yeah. are supposed to resume this week, so that hasn't happened. So mm. we, let's. I think um, the the length of the submissions um, at the start of uh, at the start of next month, I think will determine 
um, will determine whether how long it will take and whether the accusers will actually want to respond to a, to, to those re, to 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 those um to, to 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 the respondents because one of the things that emanated from Monday was that um in listening to Advocate Neil Dupree the the way he spoke about the allegations leveled against uh, AB De Villiers, Pierre Hubert and um Jacques Ford he made it sound like this is a DC therefore they need to have a set list of allegations, but that was well dealt with um, by the evidence leaders who explained that um, in the mm -hmm. transcripts, everything is said that is there. You would be able to read from there and then take the, take matters forward from that particular process. Mm -hmm. Rob, I want to I want to go back to you just quickly before we before we close. We can run a couple of minutes over. That's fine. Um, um, but not much more than that. Um, we hear it from readers all the time. You know, comparing what's going on in South African cricket. Uh, at the moment and where we find ourselves. And if you go back to Lungi uh, and uh, a year ago now, just over um, and everything that's happened since then. Um, and then you compare it to what's happened in South African rugby. Um, you know, South African rugby hasn't had a process like this. You know, what would that look like? Um, should it go through one? Why hasn't it gone through one? Uh, and how much does the fact that, you know, South Africa's rugby team is putting forward a, a, a winning um, transformed uh, team on the field every week. How much of a role does that have to play? Um, <laughs> you've answered the question. <laughs> you've, you've completely answered the question. You've, you've answered 95% of it. But winning is very, very useful. Um, and South Africa have just beaten the Lions. They uh, hold the Webb Ellis Cup, uh, the Rugby Championship trophy, and everybody's feeling very hunky-dory about rugby. So winning is, is fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are other little factors um, at play. Um, I think they are, at the moment... Um, with, you know, with a few skeletons in the closet, uh, running a tighter ship uh, administratively. Um, you know, I don't think that can really be denied. They've got a very charismatic captain, um, a sort of a, you know, a man of the people, if you like, uh, in, in Sia Colisi, who's also playing some of the rugby of his life. Um, and yes, but, but rugby has kind of, uh, um, to use a rugby analogy, sort of sidestepped uh, a lot of these crises, um, not always with good reason. I mean, uh, we've, had, we've had some flash points over the years um but that you know i mean really embarrassing to to the sort of the public image of of rugby um you know louis late uh, dragging nelson mandela to court was a was a massive sense of um sort of political humiliation in, in a very fragile um you know immediately post-democratic society um Theo Cronier not wanting to share a dressing room with uh, quinton david let's not forget that um you know from uh, the not too distant past so rugby's had its flashpoints um, but uh, somehow, this, you know, they've managed to definitely sidestep and, and probably will continue to do so uh, while Springbok rugby is, uh, is still winning. It, it's when things hit the skids, um, either on the field or in the boardroom, whatever, that's, uh, that then, you know, um, uh, is other issues come uh, and some maggots, if you like, uh, can, can come to the fore. But for the moment, mm. uh, rugby is, um, is all squeaky clean. I suppose it's not just winning, but also how you're winning, you know, I mean, the, the commitment to transformation, um, you, you know, that started uh, under Rassi uh, in a way that it was something we want to do, not something we have to do, um, you know, something we need to do, um, has translated to, to what you see on the field. And it probably um, is noticed by, by, by the public that, you know, when it comes to cricket, is, is, is less tolerant with, with what's going on at the moment. Gents, we are out of time. It's eight o'clock on the on the button. Uh, I just want to thank you all for, for that um, and for sharing your views. It was fantastic to everybody um, uh, tuning in and everyone who, who posed some questions. And I hope I hope we answered all of them as best we could. Um, yeah, it's been a difficult period for, for Cricket South Africa. Um, you know, I was speaking to, uh, for one of our stories, to Doc Ali Bacher a few days back. You guys will know. And, he, you know, he's a guy who remains uh, incredibly optimistic that, you know, South Africa has this kind of ability to to get through uh, situations like this. You know, we knew it wasn't going to be easy conversations, and and for us as journalists, not easy reporting, um, and it certainly hasn't been. Um, but you know, it's 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 steps that cricket's taking that I think we can all agree um, it needed to take. So you know, we we hope uh, as cricket lovers that when we get to the end of this, the the game is in a better place. But thank you to everybody. Um, there'll be more editors' tables coming your way on News Twenty Four uh, in the weeks ahead. Have a good night and goodbye.